It is my pleasure to introduce Plant Bot Genetics and to welcome you all to this ECHE speaker series event today. Plant Bot Genetics, working at the intersection of contemporary art and environmental advocacy. My name is Allison Locker. I am the director of the UIS Visual Arts Gallery. And your presenters are Wendy DeShane and Jeff Schmookie, who together comprise Plant Bot Genetics. Before we get started, I would like to share with you the Eche Speaker Series learning objectives. Recognize the social responsibility of the individual within a larger community. Practice awareness of and respect for the diversity of cultures and peoples in this country and in the world. Reflect on the ways involvement leadership and respect for community occur at the local, regional, national, or international levels. Identify how economic, political, and social systems operate now and have operated in the past. Engage in open-minded and ethical decision-making and action. Distinguish the possibilities and limitations of social change. I would also like to announce that in conjunction with this Eche Speaker Series event, the UIS Visual Arts Gallery is hosting a Plant Bot Genetics exhibition. That exhibition is now open and runs through September 16th. And we will have an opening event for this gallery on Thursday, September 9th from 5.30 to 8 o'clock p.m. So with that, I'd like to introduce your presenters. PlantBot Genetics combines tactical media and public space to promote critical thinking and political action on environmental issues. By imitating actual corporate practice, they underscore the potential consequences of the global corporatization of agriculture, the natural environment and public space. The PlantBot Genetics project explores the lack of transparency in corporate grafting of food production and distribution by releasing humorous next generation robot plant hybrids to prompt critical discussion on the environmental costs of intensive agricultural practices. Wendy DeShane and Jeff Schmookie began working together as Plant Bot Genetics in 2009. Each has prior experience and awards as solo artists before forming their collaboration, and both were raised with strong connections to the land around them. PlantBot Genetics has exhibited and or completed projects at the Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the Pulitzer Foundation for Art in St. Louis, Missouri, and the Goethe Institute of Cairo, Egypt. In 2010, a significant contribution to their body of work was produced at the American Academy in Rome as visiting artists. Recent exhibitions include the future at the Elaine L. Jacob Gallery of Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan, Plant Bot Genetics, a critical contact exhibition series at the Caffritz Foundation Art Center in Tacoma Park, Maryland, and artist lectures and studio visits at Long Island University in Brookville, New York. So with that, please welcome Plant Bot Genetics. It's a pleasure to be part of the Eche series at UIS and uh, our exhibition, we encourage everyone to visit our exhibition in the art, art gallery. So we usually start by giving a little background of what type of work we were making before we joined. Uh, this is, we find especially good for students, uh, but we're not gonna spend tons of time on it, but we will uh, just give you a little brief outline of what we were doing before PlantBot. I was working on a community installation called WYSIWYG, where community members would come and donate stuff that was in their how home, uh, like a stuffed animal. Everybody has like a, a bag of stuffed animals that are too sentimental to throw away, but not uh, worthy of the garbage. Like they're kind of in this weird space. They don't necessarily want to keep them. So I was allowing communities to a place to bring that. And then I was making this large installation and working with them so that they could be part of the installation because I wanted them to be engaged in the installation or in the art making in a different way than a normal exhibition. And so I went all over the country and the, the items that were made with the community and things that were donated 
stayed with the project and moved on to the next community. So people started collaborating with each other from community to community. Even if they hadn't met, they would learn about their things and see their things. And this was really important to me. I would work with children, I would work with older people because I really wanted to change what an art experience could be in my practice. And um, after about 12 years of that, I met Jeff and this is what he was doing. <laughs> and uh, so I work in ceramic sculpture, large installation. This is an example of an earlier piece. Uh, lived in Mississippi for a time until Hurricane Katrina wiped my little town off the map. And I remember watching Kudzu uh, take over a vehicle. And this is part of that experience. I want to bring new contemporary meaning to this ancient forming uh, art forming technique. So here a ceramic bowl with a very thick glaze turns around on a motorized wheel and there's a microphone where sound and texture of the bowl is translated into pixels there. Uh, so sound is created and the sound is translated into pixels from the skin of the vessel. And then my most recent work in ceramics combines figurines that are manipulated and combine Adreno uh, technology. So they're like robots that wander around and bump into each other. And it's just another way of experiencing ceramics in an unusual way. And so we'll, we'll probably, let's, let's talk about what is plant bot genetics. So to start, I mean, I think that what you see a commonality for both of us was that we both wanted to get art off its ass and doing something other than what people anticipated. And once you do that, you have to ask yourself the question, well, what or how can we use that power to speak about something? And we are interested in modern technology, in particular food issues and genetic modification. We are inspired by genetic modification. It's an incredible technology. We're not talking about pro or cons. Most of us now have already made up our minds, but we are inspired by that technology. And we went undercover at a Monsanto research station outside of Illinois. Galesburg, Illinois, and uh, we dressed as farmers and we listened to their spiel and uh, we learned in biology, Gregor Mendel uh, told us, you know, he bred like peas together and Monsanto no longer exists today, it's Bayer Corporation, but they said what they were doing was no different from what Gregor Mendel did. And we knew that was incorrect. So we thought, oh, what if we made our own plants? And this is Monsantra, a very first GM corn, a robotic plant. It's the next step in our food production. And this is our very first er iteration of it. So um, this was the very first hour that PlantBot was um, forming. And these ladies were some of our very first um, admirers and customers. And so it's a really fun slide for both of us. And pop culture also inspires us. Here we have uh, 1985, I think, Godzilla versus Biollante. Godzilla is my hero. Uh, and Biollante was a, the first genetically modified monster, a combination of human, rose, and uh, another plant DNA. And today we're, we're very interested in also how the corporate takeover, how our food is produced, how much we rely on very few corporations and companies to provide food for us. Upton Sinclair's The Jungle back in the 1930s basically changed the meatpacking industry, made it safer and more humane for the animals on their way to be processed and of course the workers too. But today, the, the Upton Sinclair's jungle could not be written. Uh, there's another image here you see with lines blocked out. That's Ozzy Zenner's Green Illusions from 2012. Back in 2012, the veggie lipo laws were instituted in nearly half the country. And it makes it illegal for us to videotape, to draw, to write about 
how our food is produced. And that is extremely troubling to us. So also, what can public art be? Um, it doesn't have to look like public art. So can you make art that's art and not have it look like what people anticipate public art to be? Does it have to be forever? Does it have to be a metal dolphin in Florida sitting on a corner? Or can it be something that's ephemeral, something that's passing, something experiential? Can public art uh, be made for a community and also create a community? So can the community coming to the art project or being part Part of the art project, can that community actually be reinvented through the project? Uh, can the art project be quiet? Does it always have to be, you know, this great big um, moment where people have, uh, in, in the slide here, it says fireworks or this big event or this big kind of moment? Does it always have to have that moment? Um, does it matter? how it's defined? Does it matter what people call it? Um, and is it okay to suspend your audience or even the artist's um, sense of disbelief? Can it be magical? Can it be um, imaginative or alternative to what people anticipate? So we do uh, function much like a corporation. We are a parody of any of the biotechs that are out there. And like any other corporation, we do advertise. And this is just an example of a more passive way we get our, our product products out there. It's a billboard in LA on the side of the road. So people who see this might just walk by and go, what's that? And, and it's that question, it's that space of not knowing that is really empowering and really powerful. And of course, those interventions or that art can exist anywhere. It can exist on a billboard like we just showed you or even back in a museum. So how can we use the public spaces of the museum for more than just passive looking at a painting um, and appreciating it in that one way that we traditionally grew accustomed to as children? Can we play with toys in front of these kind of historic markers in our culture? So art as activists, because we are activists, we're sharing information with people in the hopes that maybe uh, political action can occur. And we are inspired by a few artists. We'll share Pedro Reyes, Palace for Pistols, or Pistols into Spades. And basically, uh, Reyes, uh, in a, one of the poor uh, areas of Mexico, northern Mexico, I can't remember the name of the city, he worked with the mayor. He, they initiated a program where pistols and weapons were turned in for a voucher for food or electronics. And those, those items of destruction and murder were melted down and turned into the shovels. And those shovels were later used in the forming of a community garden. And we see them in the gallery uh, as an object, but it, the real meaning came from the community using those same objects of destruction to create life as a garden, a park for everyone. Which is very much kind of like 700 Oaks from Joseph Boys, where he was in Castle, Germany, and he planted oak trees as both um, a public art project, a beautification of the city, something that would affect the way people use the city for generations. Oops, okay. And so what are plant bots? Because we're plant bot genetics, where are plant bots? So plant bots are, again, the next step in our food production. It's the merging of plant and robot together. They seek out light, they seek out water. Uh, we hand over the controls. Some of them can be manipulated through uh, remotes and uh, they always sing and dance. So we'll take a look at some of those. And they don't care about international boundary lines or city or state lines, just like, like um, nature, it'll grow where the wind blows it. Um, it's very important that when we design these products uh, or plant bots, that they look like they belong in nature. So sometimes it's hard to photograph them and show people where the art is or where the activism is, because when they're 
engage with nature, like in the upper um, upper left hand one, especially, it looks like it should belong. So they're designed to look like they belong, just like all our other agriculture. It looks right. It looks fine. Um, but there's an underlying something else happening that you may not notice. In our case, it's very easy to make people notice them because they can have long leads and we can hit a button and they can start singing and dancing. And then people have that kind of oh my gosh, what's going on? They thought everything was as it should be. And then suddenly without warning, um, something else happens. And it's really great too that it's happening in nature and not in a gallery because when you go to a gallery space or an exhibition space, you have your art hat on and you're expecting art to happen. But when you're out in a field or on the street, you don't expect these kind of moments to happen. And so um, that's some of the tactics we're using. And so here we have an example we'll pray yeah. for you very briefly. So each of the plant bots that exist in nature is in things in dance in nature uh, have a story that somehow connects it to an environment environmental issue happening in that place. But of course, nobody wants to be preached to, nobody's going to listen to that. And so our plant bots are a really fun way to get those conversations started. So that's just an example of them in action if you haven't been to the gallery yet. <laughs> And that Britney Spears, that first one was ball. Uh, we were took over a boardwalk in in Florida, and that was ball moss, which is an invasive species. So we brought attention to this problem by using this humorous, strange, odd plant pot that drew your attention. So one of our goals for all our projects is if you want people engaged in environmentalism, if you want people engaged in what's happening to the planet, you have to get them engaged with it. So getting people back outside is really important. At the turn of the century, when children were raised, they were sent outside to draw bugs, to you know have a butterfly net and see what they could capture, to just sit outside under the sky. And our culture today tends to you know sit in front of a television or not engage in a in the same kinds of ways that we did um, as cultures for centuries. And so how can you get people back outside in a way that engages them with everything, teaches them about it, as well as you know, potentially giving them a new message? So we designed uh, nature tours where there would be our invasive plant bots. Uh, plant bots that did serve a good function or a positive uh, action. And then we would also point out natives and invasives in the same area. And we do typically wear lab coats when we're out in public. It is not important the public know we're artists, but the lab coat is the uniform for a geneticist or a plant bot scientist. And so it is uh, our uniform that we use and people uh, respond in an according fashion. And as a child, I went on these kind of boardwalks and nature walks all the time and I found them really fun. So uh, asconding them for to put plant bots in is um, an extension of, of my own culture of how I was raised. This is a boardwalk in Florida and we use the billboards that were already there for different flora and fauna and we uh, utilize them in a slightly gorilla style and put our own information and there's the button there that you could press and somewhere in that forest in front of you the plant bot would start singing and dancing and then there was information about the problem that that plant bot was trying to uh, resolve or bring attention to in a kind of funny story again interactive and the art didn't come alive until somebody engaged with it. So we began as a street-based uh, artists. You know, we didn't have a studio, the street, the public, uh, taking work from the gallery or museum into public space. 
is very important to us because art is for everyone. It's, it's easier to take art to the peoples most often than to bring people to the gallery or museum. And so we're going to talk about some of the other ways because the, the, the whole project started just growing and snowballing and getting larger. So our first lab was an off-grid um, portable structure that we could move around. And the idea of being off-grid or having battery power and solar power allowed us to not be tethered to actual outlets. And that meant we didn't have to be tethered to buildings, which really opens up a whole world of where the performance or the art or the action can happen. And then we were doing so many outside community events that we found ourselves being asked to come back to the gallery. And so we would create these spaces that utilize those mur wall murals from like 1970 of nature. I had one in the basement, my parents' basement had one. And then in the close, uh, in the, the space that you and I would take up, we would have these pedestals with plant pots. And there's an interesting, space that occurs between the wall mural and the actual plant. It looks like it's actually there right in that rainforest. So not only is there this inside, outside, what is real, what is not real, um, there's also this play of high and low, which artists love to do because these murals are, you know, pop, again, pop culture, and they would be in the basements. Um, and, you know, then you're in a high art it's, so it's a mix of all these kinds of things and trying to create new spaces by mixing up and recontextualizing things. And just another uh, plant bot exhibition with some of the plant bots that you might see in the gallery there at UIS. But even in the exhibition, it's really important that it's interactive. And so what happens is that we make sure that things are friendly and approachable. Um, and often they'll break and we're constantly remaking them or refixing them or recycling whatever we can because we want people to touch them. We don't wanna be these precious objects that uh, sit on a pedestal and aren't touched or used. And there's always information that talks about the problem or where or what these plant bots do. And this experience of being engaged uh, with the work, people remember. Facts and figures are easily lost. And we also include actual life plants. I mean, they're all real, right? You can see them and they're real, but this is an installation that produces food and was basically donated to a homeless shelter. So your individual actions do add up. They do make a difference. And this is all recycled components, usually items found at the uh, hardware store. So the materials themselves are very easily found and democratic. And it's just, we would teach you how to do your own garden or hydroponic system. And so it's very important to understand that we started out on the street and I loved making street art. And I was, uh, another project I was doing before I met Jeff was, you know, projecting on the sides of buildings off grid without permission. And I was really playing on the street, but I always wanted to make street art. I always wondered how could we make it more sophisticated? How could we bring more to it? And of course the solution for having the most sophisticated kind of systems for street art was an enclosed trailer. Cause then you could have electrical installations in the trailer that um, allowed so much more, including projections from the trailer and turning it into a library of information. So this, we see an image here of a bookmobile. I mean, I had one growing up. I mean, I'm a child of the seventies. I grew up in a very rural area and I loved every Thursday, the bookmobile would come by and it was a mobile library and our art lab seen here is very much based on that information that that accessible information where people come through the trailer and you begin a discussion and oh you're interested in composting well guess what we have some takeaway information for you so this is 
uh, essentially uh, the it's all solar powered it's an 18 footer and the solar power is stored in batteries which also power outside events so the trailer is a platform for discussion and engagement everything is designed for people to come up to us and ask us questions questions um, and, and promote curiosity. And as soon as people are curious and in good mood, they're laughing at a plant bot, they will then have all kinds of serious discussions they would not have if we were standing on a soapbox and sit on the corner and saying, hey, we think that you should do this or think about that. People just ignore you. You're a crazy person. Or especially in today's environment, people of differing viewpoints just don't talk to each other or they just, you know, ah, that's not what I want to hear. So I'm just going to ignore you. So we're trying to create an environment of curiosity, of experience, of fun, so that those conversations happen organically based on the audience member. We then take them whichever direction that that person wants to take them, whether it's about the solar power in the trailer for their hunting cabin or mothing with their children, whatever information they want to talk about our responsibility is to make it available and be prepared through the library or handouts or talking to scientists and imparting information to our audience that has wandered into our world. And you know, it it it's it's also important to know that even the outside of the trailer becomes a billboard for information that we post. So inside and outside. Uh, space is vital. And so we'll talk about now how we the dissemination of knowledge through experience, because that is a foundation of our practice. So <laughs> this is one of favorite of Jeff's favorite pieces. He usually talks about it. <laughs> so attackaratus, I don't know if we so the attackaratus uh, is based on super bugs and super weeds in the fields our fields today we are our reliance on pesticides and pre-emergence has created strains of weeds that no weed killer can get rid of the only way to get rid of is to pull them up and then the super bugs because insects have such a high rate of generations they breed very quickly they become immune to whatever we spray on our fields they actually start living off it. So I created these little uh, insect plants that were safely contained in these containers and you push the red button on top. It's connected to an amplifier. They're very loud. They start moving and they look like they're trying to escape. And we had a series of eight canisters of the attack apparatus. Uh, and and it basically the story goes along with this work and people like wow super weeds and super bugs it's a real thing this is a real thing we're encountering now and in nashville it was the music city so having this kind of weird piano <laughs> i don't know if we could call it a piano but they all made a different no a different slightly different sound when you hit them and activated them and so you could play really crazy music with this and i will say there's <laughs> two of these in the gallery there and you need to check them out because they're a little scary they're our scariest one and and so um the plant bots usually look like the space that they're in um so this is arizona so these are succulents uh we do try and contextualize them to the place there's a great example of the dissemination of the knowledge on the side of the trailer. So the, the this poster was about what you can, what a community could do to help pollinators in their area. And the poster was created in workshops with us um, and then put on the side of the trailer for community events. So again, engaging people as much as possible to share the information. We did talk to scientists, we can't clarify that enough. Whenever we're trying to figure out ways to share information, we wanna make sure we have the right information. So we always talk to scientists. A scientist help us create these field guides. They're free and downloadable. When we do residencies, we can create one of these and leave them with the community so that they can have it when we go. You could pay a little bit of money and get the book or you could download it for free. And it's kind of like a, 
starter guide to your backyard using something that's really fun, accessible, and not harmful to anybody, moths. Um, and so this is one of the other solutions we have to leave a lasting in impact for after we move on. And that project leads us to the moth project, which became a big part of what we started talking about. As our project matured, people started understanding some of the issues we were originally talking about, like GMOs. When we started the project, people didn't know what a GMO was. Um, and so that wasn't as important a, a, a push for the project, but what was is bee collapse was really starting about, I think we started the moths about six years ago. That was uh, becoming a greater problem and people and scientists didn't know what to do or why. And so we wanted to, talk about bee decline because bees are a huge part of agriculture and one in six bites of our food comes from bees. Um, one in three. One, one in three. three. I'm sorry, I was going to say, I think I got that wrong. One in three bites of our food. So you can imagine one in three bites of your food not existing um, and how sad you know um, our world would be or how less colorful and just a lot of science to think that if the bees went, the, the economic and agricultural collapse that would happen would be, un, we wouldn't be able to recover from it. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the European honeybee that's uh, gone down 60% since 1950 and they're continuing to decline. They're an environmental indicator. They tell us about the farming practices. It's bees from from the bumblebee, which pollinates only certain flowers and plants, down to ground other ground bees based bees. And it's not just bees, it's pollinators of all kinds. And we are very interested in working with pollinators due to the fact they're collapsing across the board. And you know, I think of all the things we would miss, like Wendy said, when I have every three bites of food, even if you like hamburgers. Alpha Alpha is uh, as bee assisted pollinators. What about cotton shirts? I'm not really fond of synthetics, you know, polyester, leave it in the 70s. We need cotton. Cotton is also bee assisted pollinated. I think of, of Halloween without pumpkins. What a sad, sad time that would be. And I like, I'm in, you know, if I, I'm in Georgia. What, what about peaches? That would be a big loss. So even chocolate is pollinated by a fly. So if you like chocolate, you should be concerned. And these are just some of the things that pollinators, uh, some of the items that pollinators, but it's also there's bats that are pollinators, there's beetles, there's flies, even hummingbirds are a pollinator. So how do you talk about bee decline with communities because people are afraid of bees or they are allergic to them? And so we really wanna talk about this colony collapse disorder. Um, and so we do that in twofold. We do talk about the bees, but we also bring in moths. And so with colony collapse disorder, we also have learned that there are solutions. There are things that we can do. And one of the things throughout the project that we try not to do is just tell people about the doom and gloom. Here's the problem. Oh my gosh. And not give them any kind of way of solving that problem or helping out or trying to be the solution. And so um, it's important that we talk about solutions in all kinds of different ways. So this um, poster that would be part of um, one of our trailer events talks about distinct solutions people can make, like habitat loss. You know, the fact that we just have grass on all our lawns does nothing for anybody except use a lot of resources. But there's no food there for the beneficial insects. So if we all just did a strip of wildflowers um, by our house or along a fence, we'd actually be giving these bees and other pollinators food to snack on. And so that's a really easy solution that everybody can do. And who wouldn't want a couple of flowers growing in their yard? And one of the problems is monoculture. The way we farm today has weakened the entire uh, ecosystem to create colony collapses or the fact that for miles and miles, it's the same crop 
it's like us eating pizza for a month because the the blooms are there for the bees and other pollinators and all of a sudden for miles and miles the bloom is gone so you starve and you're not going to feel really great living off pizza maybe the first couple of days you feel great but you're going to be sick and you know, spraying the, our reliance on pesticides and fertilizers, uh, compounded by the lack of diversity due to monoculture, and we rely on bees to such a degree. We have to chip them. We have to transport them all over the country, and they really hate being moved. So that is one of the reasons uh, why we. We really try to educate and promote pollinator friendly practices. And just as an example, this plant tag from one of the big box store, we were very excited four years ago. They were saying, oh, we're going to start we're going to start labeling uh, plants treated with neonicotinoids and neonics or neonicotinoids are a class of insecticide that has been proven. We have stacks of information proving that they affect the bee's synapse firing in the bee's brain. And when neonicotinoids, an insecticide class that's sprayed, it's systemic. The plant absorbs it, even the soil holds it for seven years. And we need to ban this neonic class of insecticide. But look how this is labeled. This is pure greenwashing. This plant is protected from problematic aphids, white flies, beetles, mealybugs, and other unwanted pests by neonics. No one would know the plant, the flowers you're buying to beautify your yard will kill pollinators. Yeah, it will kill bad bugs, but it's gonna kill everything across the board. So they said, yay, we're gonna label, everybody will know, but then they, like Jeff said, greenwashed. So it's really hard to know when you're going into a, a store as a consumer, what is the best choice? Because the whole uh, system is set to confuse you and to make you feel like you're doing the right thing, even though you may not be. And so the moth project grows from from all of that. And like I, we said earlier, the moths are a gentle, beautiful um, insect that also pollinate and are also part of what would happen to other species that, that pollinate, but like the bees. Um, and here is a moth with beautiful orchid pollen on it. And often a moth has a symbiotic relationship with a plant that we don't even know. So there was a little a moth, a little brown moth that was pollinating the Carolina lily, which is a very um, important lily culturally. People love it. Um, and if pesticide had been used and sprayed and killed all that little brown moth up until about 13 or 14 years ago, nobody would have even known why the lily went away. If we had killed that moth, which is just this little brown indescript moth, nobody would know that that was what had happened to it. And there are, I mean, there's Harvard, there are MIT, they are developing robot bees but we know how to save the bees we have. We just need to take better care of the environment and to change our farming practices and the ban neo neonics. And here we have our plant bot version using old transistor technology from yesteryear and our robot bee, it's probably not going to work either. And, you know, to be honest, you're not going to get honey from robot bees either. So that'd be a loss, but bees are, uh, Moths are very friendly. They they land on you. They won't bite you. They're attracted by light. You usually, you know, people don't know much about moths, and they're just as beautiful as butterflies who get all the attention. So, what can we do to help help our pollinators? Well, Wendy mentioned it earlier. You could call your extension office or talk to a gardener on your street and plant wildflowers. Wildflowers uh, basically come back every year and they don't need a lot of uh, attention. They self-sow. And if everyone just planted a strip along their fence line and got rid of some grass, that would help pollinators a great deal because bees, like me, need to snack a, a little bit along as we go throughout our day. So let's talk about mothing. 
So if people, again, if we can connect people to things in their yard, they will take better care of them, right? And so mothing um, is a very easy way to connect to the things in your yard that you don't even know are there. And so this is one of our professional tents with the light. Um, and we hook it up to solar power whenever possible. These are um, recycled uh, military carts, surplus carts from this, I think before we were even born that had sit around in a warehouse for like 25 or 30 years. And we went and got them and we turned them into these portable solar power uh, modules that we could move around again, bringing power to wherever we need it. And these can help light our tents up. Um, and here is a tent with a bunch of different moths, including some Luna moths, which are about the, you know, the size of the cross width of your hand, if not a little bit more, they're a big silk moth. They only live for seven days before um, they are no more. And so that whole point of being in that form as a Luna moth is to party. So that's their party dress. They're going out to have babies, to procreate. Uh, and that's really interesting to know that they're only in this form for seven days. So if you see one, you shouldn't interfere with it or hurt it. It's not, they don't even have a mouth because as in their caterpillar form, they ate everything they needed. And again, they're very friendly. They, they, we've been in situations with the light and it, there's, it's like snow, they're falling on you. And we, people are running from tent to tent. Uh, this, this sort of event at night lights up the area. It glows. It's like a spaceship landed. People see it and start asking questions. And it's just the accessibility component along with curiosity. You're promoting environmental literacy. Once you know a little bit about moths, they become much more interesting. And now you know how valuable they are. And the experience of seeing them on the tent and, and is really, I think, more impactful than just talking about them. To go into your yard or another yard and spending that time and talking to others or scientists about how beautiful they are and how important they are, I think that is really impactful. So cross-pollinating with community members and scientists, we always follow the law. We have to get scientific research and collection permits we don't do destructive sampling. Everything you see here is any documentation is through photograph. We don't harm any moths. And, you know, just the difference between a moth and a butterfly. A moth has a very thick furry body with the feathery antenna usually, and they, they come out at night. Moths come out at night. Their furry body keeps them warm, but there's always exceptions to the rule. And so when they land, they're usually their wings are out. Whereas a butterfly, they're up because they're hot, they're in the sun, and so they'll often land like this. But it's a very large class, so there's not one rule for everything. There's always a little rogue um, moth breaking the rules somewhere. So in general, though, if they're landing like this, they are a butterfly. And Lepidoptera, which both moths and butterflies are a part of, there's about 137,000 different kinds and more are being discovered every year. So we talked about some interesting moth facts. You know, some are born without a mouth. Uh, a male can smell a female from seven, eight miles away. And how do you attract them? You put a UV light out, a light that that we our eyes don't pick up, but UV radiation emitting from a light will insects can see that from miles away and as artists i'm really interested in how they can camouflage themselves into the landscape they can make themselves look like bird park or bird poop or not bird but bark they can make themselves look like tree bark or bird poop and uh, if you are really important to songbirds as a source of food which a lot of people don't understand then you are going to want to camouflage yourself away from getting eaten and the snowberry uh clear wing here he is camouflaging himself as a stinging insect this moth does not sting but looks like something that would again to try and deter being food um if moths were to go away food for songbirds would go away and we would also then have a massive bird decline. So 
Do you want to talk about this? So one? this mm -hmm. is a moth uh, that looks like bird poop. And of course, a bird isn't going to eat the moth because who would eat that, right? Bird poop, you're not going to touch. So it's a bird dropping moth. Uh, the wood nymph moth is another version of a bird dropping moth. It's camouflaged to look like, well, poop. And then the rosy maple moth. There, I mean, people, I don't think understand how beautiful moths are or that they can be colorful. Most people say, oh, I just like they're brown. And there's many examples where they are not brown. And this one looks like ice cream to me. But it is. It can mimic a rose petal or maybe leaves that change in the fall. This is the southern flannel moth. As a caterpillar, its spikes are a little bit poisonous, but as soon as it develops into a moth, it's this gorgeous little fluffy, uh, I like to call it a fashion moth because it looks like it's wearing fluffy boots. Um, the tiger moth, uh, actually fractal patterns in the wings when it's flying disrupt the sonar of bats and it, it's hard for birds to focus on where this moth is going because it looks like it could be going this way but the pattern makes it look like it's and these the camouflage way. patterns were actually used by the navy on the sides of ships in the 60s and 70s so that because of the way that the fractaling works throughout space you can't see the ships and so we we as a culture take a lot about um from looking at these kind of uh, animals and plants and insects. So this sheet is on our website. You can download it, uh, monsantra.com. And all these moths are found in your area. And they're easily identifiable. And all you need to do is put a fluorescent light or a black light, which has that UV radiation. An old white sheet. <laughs> An old white sheet tied up between two trees. A, bl is a black light is only nine or $10 at Walmart. It's super cheap um, to get your whole family involved in seeing what's out there. And of course, the trailer is multi purpose. It, it, it works with both uh, pollinator bots or plant bots and of course the moth project. And this is just uh, an, uh, a simple image of five tents set up, people moving from tent to tent, they're engaged in discussion. Uh, there's an entomologist there to identify the moth. And the project can go anywhere because it's off grid. And I think we're running out of time. So we'll just go through these last slides a little quick. But anywhere that we want to have this conversation, we can have it because it's off grid. Um, we can end with this story. Um, you never know when a conversation is going to change the course of things. So if you don't have that conversation, nothing will happen. But here we are in Hortus Botanicus. Um, it's one of the oldest gardens in Europe. Actually, I think it is the oldest garden in Europe and it's in Amsterdam. And they have this beautiful botanical garden. It's been there um, to collect the plants from the explorers all up through the culture today. And they invited us to come and have this conversation. We set up tents, we had moss come, we explained to everybody what we were doing and told them all about the moss and about neonicotinoids and how they're a problem. And the people in the audience turned to the director of the garden that night and said, we don't use neonicotinoids, do we? And he looked at them and he said, yes, we actually do. And they were like, why? Why would we use those knowing this? And the director of the garden said he didn't know that people would care. And we got, we went back to our residency and we got a call the next day saying that the garden was no longer going to use neonicotinoids and they were going to, you know, promote better practices. And this was from the instant um conversation they had after we were done between the audience that they didn't know would care and the and the garden director and we don't anticipate change to happen that quickly by any stretch but we were like really excited that it can uh, and that there was a real life example of of how positive change can be enacted by just a tiny bit of community involvement individual actions matter
they all add up. Thank and you. These are just, yeah, we don't need to talk about all that. <laughs> Thank you very much. I got it. Mm. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Wendy and Jeff. That was great. Uh, I would like to um, open up for Q&A if anybody here has anything they'd like to ask the presenters. I have a question. Yes, Casey. Um, so uh, thank you so much. It was a great presentation. And I really um, did research on you a little bit earlier today and was just amazed at, at your, your whole process. So um, thank you for giving this presentation. Um, but my question is for students primarily, what kind of advice would you give to either a student or a very um, early career artist who wants to try something like this, who wants to try public mm. art or maybe a parody um, of some sort? Is there maybe something that you wish you would have known before you uh, started or is there just you know something that you would like to pass along? The first thing I would say is that bring all your skills to the table. Uh, you don't know which of your skills is going to be the one that breaks your project through or allows your project to, to happen. Um, I was a bartender for a large part of my life, and who knew that that would actually help in, in aiding to my skill set in able to talk to people. I can walk up to anybody and talk to them about whatever they want because I was a bartender for like 20 years of my life, you right. know, and that's basically what a bartender does. And so that's a skill that I didn't, it's a soft skill. I didn't realize I even had it, um, but I'm able to bring that skill to the table in addition to all my art skills. And it allows a power, an empowerment in the project that I think helps make it successful. Right. I, I would agree that you never know what you learn in class that you can pull out of your toolbox. You've heard that before. And me being the very the shy one of the two. <laughs> I, I'm, an, I'm an introvert. <laughs> I would say collaborate with other people. Bring your friends. If you're like, oh, I don't want to talk to people alone. Well, have your posse there with you and they can back you up and they can they can be holding props or having information you want to share or also engage other people around. So it's easier to collaborate, to have an impact with with friends or other folks in your your community i mean it's hard to do it alone it's, so pair up it's also more fun and we have a completely different skill set um and it, i wouldn't call him an introvert by any stretch but <laughs> um but he comes from a sculptural background and i come from a 2d kind of it, um digital background and so between the two of us, we basically have anything we want to do covered, but on our own, we wouldn't have that. And so it also just gives you access by working with, with your peers or your friends, or even people that you just want to meet, like a scientist that you're really interested in. It gives you access to so much more, um, just more, more everything right? More ideas, more skills, more expertise, more fun. It's just, it's a more well-rounded experience. And I'll add, go and see everything because if someone would have walked up to us and said, hey, you're going to be working with moths and bees, and plant and robots. I'm like, what? <laughs> so you have to go and see everything because you don't know what's going to influence you outside the studio. So go to every talk, even if it's in science or so wherever on campus, go listen in and meet other people outside your department. It's powerful when two different ways of thinking or studies or disciplines come together. That's, that's the in-between spaces where new inventions come from that, new ways of seeing the world come from that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. That was great advice. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much, Chrissy. Uh, more questions? I have one. Yes, Grace. 
Um, so I'm an environmental science major, so this is very interesting to me, but one of the parts that stood out to me is you said you try to not just focus on the doom and gloom, and I know that sometimes, especially in recent years, um, environmental issues can just feel very daunting to tackle. Um, I know you guys were saying you try to look for solutions too, so have you ever had a, a problem that you've tried to talk about that you haven't necessarily had a solution for? What's your process? Do you ever have the community be involved in kind of trying to think of solutions? Um, just thinking of that, because I know there's not always an easy solution like with the pollinators. Um, so just kind of curious about your process. I think a great place to start is knowledge, like just knowing about the problem. Um, I think like when we started the project with GMOs, people didn't know what a GMO was. And we were in Galesburg where there's a big Monsanto factory, like literally 10 miles from the town. Um, and that conversation is so imperative to get people to even understand what's going on. Even if you don't necessarily have a nice and tidy solution. And, you know, we all want to have those tidy solutions, right? And uh, they're, they, 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 they help to a point. But we, if we all understand how it's interconnected or understand the problems I, and we become more engaged at a different level, that's going to help towards any solution, even if you don't have a specific one at that moment, right? Right. Awareness is the first step in finding a solution. And I tend to believe that all the different disciplines on the planet have a small piece of the puzzle that if we all came together and could collaborate and maybe give up certain things that we feel are so vital to our daily existence like maybe turning the air conditioner up just a few degrees could i mean it's a mat that's 30 percent energy savings right there i mean i look back when i was growing up jamie carter asked us to put on a sweater and and people his ratings stayed low because of that uh during the energy crisis and we had solar panels at one time and our house is fueled by solar panels but they're kind of expensive today so there are so many ways to create an impact but i believe discussing the issue without the focus on the doom and gloom and ideating or creating silly solutions is is possibly a first step to coming to one that's actually going to have impact and and remembering that culture is fluid right um i like to think of like the trajectory of the water bottle when i was a child we drank from the hose you know if we were outside and we were thirsty it was like you just went and drank from the hose because your parents you know it was the 70s you were outside they didn't care <laughs> right and then by the 80s you know this thing called perrier started showing up and water in bottles became fancy and then you know by the 90s water in bottles was just everybody had them you know it was water from anywhere bottled and everybody was drinking from them and by the end of the 90s we're all like what are we doing with all these bottles right and now you know like here even sitting beside us we have this metal you know canteen we walk around with that everywhere so when you think of like we went from a culture that never needed a, wa a plastic water bottle to thinking they were fancy, to thinking that they were a problem, to everybody having them, to them being a problem, to now us kind of weaning ourselves off of them. Well, that's just in my lifetime, you know, and I'm I'm not 80 yet or anything, you know. So we are fluid as as um, and that's kind of hopeful to think about. And if we can be part of getting people to just push or nudge people into the fluidity of positive change, that can be a, a micro solution uh, without a major, uh, you know, without necessarily having a, a nice tidy solution for something. So I, I tend to think of farmers markets, you know, is it, is it necessary to transport a salad a thousand miles to your store? Uh, maybe a simple uh, uh, response to that is just to support your local a uh, farmer's market where it's locally produced. And that would maybe uh, create more of a market for that farmer or that farmer's market area. So that's just vote with your feet. 
uh, support with your pocketbook, essentially. And that could have, that's something we all can do. And, you know, the prices aren't that much different if you look at, if you look at the impact on the environment. So I hope that was helpful. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have a question about your, your, your work relies often on the presence of humor as you navigate you know, weighty and heavy, heavy topics. Can you talk about why you rely on humor and, and how that functions for you? Sure. Jeff used to make everyone cry. <laughs> So I, I made, I made really quite dark work, uh, because I went through Katrina and the just, funny one, <laughs> but, but it would just, it, it, that it was kind of doom and gloom and I wasn't getting the reaction and Wendy just showed me the way. <laughs> so, but humor it's more fun for us in addition yeah. to being more approachable for you know anybody we're not necessarily making art for people who are going to go to a museum right or who are going to go to a gallery we're making art for anybody that we bump into um and when you put that kind of thinking how do i make art out of this context of this history you know and and this, you know, specific language. I was trained as a painter. I went to a really fancy painting school and everybody was making paintings for like five other people. And I, I get that and there's a place for that, but I never wanted to make paintings for those five other people. And so how do you then get people engaged in whatever you're doing? And humor just seemed like it's such a, it, it seems it's a like a, it's a base answer, but humor seemed to be like being funny or, you know, likable or this thing that's odd or weird, but still like, you know, what is that? That is just, that, that's where all the power of it, everything we do relies on that. And, um, and like you, like when he said, it makes you approachable. People are more likely to engage in an authentic discussion. They trust you more. They're they, not confrontational. Yeah, <laughs> it's fun. And people let their defenses down. And we, we have a real talk you know it's 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 fluid it's organic it's and when jeff is driving that little robot plant around that was in one of the first slides he was having a blast <laughs> right like it was so fun for him he was like "Ooh, look at this people and and he would bump it into people and it also makes it more fun for us so it's just more pleasant i think all around <laughs> and we we often <laughs> hand over the controls to the the public too and they feel what i was feeling and i want to share that and then once once that is happening everyone's having a good time then we start throwing in questions or or they volunteer a, a more serious question to us and we are always ready to share with them the information that we have and other sources that they can look up because we're artists we're not scientists although we collaborate with them we always make sure our, our, our stuff is fact-checked and we have that library, uh, the trailer to, to back us up. And, and you know, we run into people more than once throughout the years. And wow, I now have an organic garden and the worms feed everything or, or I have wildflowers and now I throw the seeds in my neighbor's yard and boy, things are going great. So, so one of the other things that no matter what country we're working in is the plant bots are funny, right? And it just, it, it talks to a base humanity that we all share. And I think the likability comes from the fact that people get humor and want to be part of it. And it, it, it brings people together um, in a way that, that I, I don't I just can't think of another tool that that can do that we can be in France and a singing plant bot will make people laugh you know and we can be in any culture and that is funny uh, and so I I think I worry about like not not maybe finding the next new funny thing <laughs> because it is so powerful and it is such a huge part of our practice. Thank you. Um, any more questions? No? 
Okay, well, I really would love to thank everybody so much for being here today. And especially Wendy, Jeff, uh, it's been amazing to hear from you today and to be in the presence of your exhibition. Everybody, please stop by the Visual Arts Gallery. It's very popular. People are really engaging with the work with a lot of enthusiasm. It doesn't hurt that the gallery is located in the Health and Sciences Building. Uh, and uh, we're very, very happy to have it here. So thank you so much. And thanks to everybody. Thank, thank you, you all for having us and being amazing hosts and, and supporting the exhibition and this talk. Mm -hmm.